Good morning, everybody. I'm René Garcia, and uh, I'm very happy to see you all in person. It has been a long time. So I'm delighted to uh, introduce our first invited speaker, Stefano Giglio, from the Professor of Finance at the Yale School of Management. So when you look at uh, Stefano's contribution over the last 10 years or so, what strikes you is the number of prizes and awards he has um, he has got for his papers, almost all papers have an award. <laughs> and of course, I mean, all these papers end up in top journals, uh, either in finance or economics. Now, if you consider also that, you know, they are not on one topic, I mean, they cover many important topics in asset pricing, then this is a truly remarkable um, record. I mean, like he has contributed in housing and climate change with a long run discount rate, uh, option pricing, um, systemic risk, variance risk. I mean, uh, lately he has contributed in the factor models and machine learning. And um, it is on this last topic that um, he will uh, talk today. He had two first important papers on uh, taming the factor to a test for new factors and asset pricing with weighted factors where factors were pervasive, right? Now, recently he has worked, he has started to work with weak factors and he has a working paper, um, test asset and weak factors. And today he will uh, entertain us with prediction when the factors are weak. So Hello. the floor is yours. Thank you very much for accepting the invitation. All right, so first of all, thank you very much for the kind, for the kind introduction. And thank you, uh, of course, for inviting me to present today. Uh, as Renee was saying, uh, this is part of this uh, work that we're doing with the Cheng and, and Dake on, uh, on weak factors that really stems from this first work we did on strong factors and we now we you know progressively weaken it. Okay, so this paper is about prediction when factors are weak. So as a bit of a, of a motivation, you know, factor models uh, play a very prominent role uh, in forecasting. You know, think of uh, Stock and Watson, uh, for example, 2002. And um, you know, it, since then, PPCA has been basically one of the most prevalent uh, approaches, and then it's been extended in many different ways. Uh, and the procedure that use, uses PCA to, re, to, to do forecasting is actually very simple. You take a bunch of a large number of predictors, you summarize the information via principal components, and then you use these factors you recover to forecast uh, the targets. So it's, it's it, you know, it, it's consistent uh, under some assumption, and it's, uh, it's simple and it's very practical. So the starting point for this paper is that the theoretical justification for PCA is really uh, relying on a very convenient uh, but very important assumption that factors are strong. So that basically predictors all, you know, they, they kind of load sufficiently on these factors to allow for the recovery of the factors from the predictive, uh, predictor's data. Now, there's a recent paper. So this, of course, goes back to Bayan Eng. Uh, there is a recent paper by Bainang that, that relaxes this condition, showing that PCA still recovers consistently the factors under weaker conditions, which I'm going to uh, discuss later. Um, that said, you know, PCA is still fundamentally an unsupervised approach. And if there is enough noise in the data, so if the signal to noise ratio is sufficiently low, then, uh, then PCA will fail. You, you will not recover the uh, the, the, the principal components consistently. And in fact, this, the, the space. Uh, spanned by these, the recovery components can be nearly orthogonal to the true uh, factor space. Okay, so basically, if there is insufficient noise, PCA phase, and PCA phase because it can distinguish what's truly common variation from idiosyncratic noise. <coughs> in this paper, we go, in a sense, a step weaker than by an end. So we consider an entire, I, I would argue, pretty large range of weakness. Uh, it, 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 therefore, a setting in which PCA will fail to recover the fact, but as, as we'll show you later, uh, if we use a supervised approach, we can actually end up recovering actually all those weak factors that, that the unsupervised approach like PCA cannot recover. So the key, um, the key intuition of this paper is that, you know, there's a range of weakness that is not recoverable uh, uh, in a, using an unsupervised approach, but once we start using some supervision, we can actually recover uh, the factors, even if they're weak. Okay, so what do we do in this paper? More specifically, we propose the procedure that we call supervised PCA. And what supervised PCA does is basically adds a selection step. 
instead of taking principal components from the entire set of predictors and then using them for forecasting, what supervised PCA does is uses the target itself to supervise a selection of a subset of the, of the, of the predictors. And then you take the principal components only of that subset. Okay, so that's the main idea. You will see that it's actually tricky to, to write, to, you know, to implement supervised PCA in a multi-factor setting, and that's the really core contribution of the paper. Okay, so why does PCA fail when factors are weak? Well, there's actually two types of weakness of factor. They're really statistically the same. Okay, uh, if you want, you know, algebraically they're the same, but but uh, but conceptually they're a little bit distinct. One, which is the standard case, is basically the case in which you have one factor uh, on which all the predictors lo load very weak. Okay, so there's there's say there's a thousand predictors, you have a factor and almost all the exposures of the predictors to a factors are close to zero, okay? And then PCA fails to recover this factor from the predictors. That's the kind of classic case, but there's another case which is also interesting, which is suppose you have multiple factors and the exposures of the various predictors to the, to the factors are highly correlated. Then also you cannot distinguish the factors via uh, principal components cannot distinguish the two factors, okay? Because basically all the predictors, the predictors log in a similar way on the two factors. So the second case of highly correlated exposures turns out to be co completely equivalent up to a rotation to the first to the first case. <coughs> okay, so this will be the case where um, these are all cases that can happen in practice because, for example, we might have uh, factors that are very close related to each other, and therefore the exposures might may, might also be related to each other. Okay, so these these are all cases where if there is enough noise, basically PCA will fail. Now, why does supervised PCA help? Is because it may be, and that doesn't need to be the case, I will tell you exactly under what condition this is gonna be the case, but it may be that even if out of the thousand uh, predictors I have, there's maybe only, let's say 50, that actually load on some factor, that factor will be weak in the entire universe of predictors. But if I, I may be able to find a subset of the assets, where if I kind of focus on that subset, then that factor is strong. Um, so, for example, if I can identify these 50 uh, predictors, then, you know, within those 50 predictors, the factor will be strong and PCA will, will, will manage to recover the factor. The question is, how do we identify that factor? PCA on its own can do that, okay? Sorry, how do we identify that set? That's what I meant, or predictors, where the factor is strong. PCA on its own cannot do it, but we can use external information. The external information comes from the target. So the target will be used to figure out which of these thousand predictors actually uh, contain usable information about that latent factor that is weak and which don't. Now, you already see what's going, what's going to happen is that, of course, 950 of these, uh, of these predictors will be thrown away. And so the question is, how much damage do we get by throwing away these predictors, right? When you do selection, you're, you're, you're focusing on some predictors and you're removing others. So of course there will be things that have been thrown away. The question is whether the thing is thrown away is going to affect the the um, the, uh, the 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 forecast. Okay. So the way that we're going to select the predictors is we're going to look at univariate correlations between the predictors and the target. So we're going to only keep basically those predictors that sufficiently correlate with the target. So what are the things that we throw away? Well, there there are predictors that don't correlate very highly with the target. Now, there could be two possibilities why they don't correlate highly with the target. One is just you know, noise. They're not very useful predictors in any case, so we can throw them away. It may also be that these other 950 uh, predictors, they may ex contain exposure to some factors. But if they, low, if they have low correlation with the target, it's because they might be exposed to factors that are not very useful for prediction. So the point is, by, by selecting based on the univariate correlations, we are basically, uh, we're, we're kind of missing things, but we're missing things that are not useful for prediction. Okay, so now I should say the concept of supervised PCA doesn't originate with us. It originates with, with a paper by Berent, Tipshirani, and Forward Papers, uh, in which basically they propose this technique and they show the consistency and so on. But importantly, they, they show all of the, you know, they, 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 they propose a procedure and they derive their properties basically under assumptions under the assumption that there's basically only one factor. Or if you want to extend it, you know, under the assumption that all the factors are the same strength, okay? But for, for economic applications, I think it's very important that we deal with a kind of richer world where there are multiple factors and there are potentially different strength. There's no theoretical justification whatsoever for, 
for thinking that, you know, either in a surprising or in this case, in the context of prediction, that we should have all factors of the same strength, okay? Hey, so really the contribution of this paper is to show how, you know, we can do supervised PCA in a multi-factor setting where potentially the different factors are different strength, okay? How do we do it? Well, we, we introduce an additional step, which is a projection step and an iterative procedure. So the way our procedure is gonna work, I'm gonna do all this formally later, okay? Just to give a bit of an intro. Uh, the way we're gonna do it is we're gonna first do a selection and cut down a set of assets, extract the factor, and then we're gonna go back to the entire universe of the, of the predictors, and we're gonna project these predictors onto, um, onto the first factor and get the residuals, right? And now we can do this, the same selection again among the entire universe of predictors, but this time they're residuals, okay? So we eliminate the first factor, and now we can go back and do the same procedure again. So the second time we might actually get a, set, a different set of, predi uh, of, of predictors, okay? So the idea, what allows us to, to deal with multiple factors is that we, we, every time we go back to the entire universe and we potentially select a different subs. Okay, so that's the idea of, of, of super, our kind of multi-factor supervised PCA. We justify formally our procedure in an asymptotic scheme where we have N and T, so the cross set, the number of predictors and a time series going to uh, going to infinity at potentially different rates. We show that under what I'm, you know, I think it's gonna be pretty clear what are gonna be the assumptions, but under certain assumptions, which I think are pretty weak, you get a consistent prediction. And um, if you make an additional assumption, which I'll discuss later, you can get stronger results. You can estimate consistent number of weak factors. You can entirely record the factor space and you can provide a prediction interval, okay, for, for the time. Um, okay, so that's gonna be kind of where I'm gonna go next. So I'm gonna go pretty fast on the literature review. Um, basically, you know, of course, there's many papers that have looked, they've studied the, you know, different strength of, of weakness of factors. It's, it's nice to think of this literature on a continuum, right? Where you have on one end of the spectrum, you have this old, you know, the standard results on PCA, uh, with strong factors. On the other hand, you have papers like the ones of Natsuki where you have basically completely weak factors, so weak they are unrecoverable, okay? So <coughs> basically these are cases where the eigenvalues of the factors are exactly the same order as the idiosyncratic noise and there's just no hope to recover that, okay? So even our procedure will not recover those. So there's a, there's a range at the very bottom of this, you will not recover anything. By an end, the recent 2021 paper uh, uh, allows for a uh, weaker factor than PCA, but there's still this entire range in between that is not covered by standard unsupervised approaches. And that's where our paper uh, will sit. Uh, I should also say there's a, there's a parallel literature on the spike covariance models, which I'm not gonna review now. The closest paper is Wang and Fan. Um, but again, all these papers, they basically assume the factors are all the same strength, which I think is uh, important to kind of um, deviate from when we think about uh, about practical uh, applications in finance and economics. Okay, we're ready for the model. The model is very simple, it's a K-factor model. Okay, so there's two equations only in this paper, really. Uh, it's not true. There is X, T is, is, are the predictors. There's N predictors, and is, you know, think of N as large. F, T are the latent factors are not observed. Beta is, the, is gonna be very important. It's the matrix of exposures of the predictors on the targets, uh, sorry, on the, on the factors. And then on the, on the right side of the equation, uh, yt plus h is the target that we're trying to predict at the horizon h. Um, alpha is the loading of the target onto the factors, okay? And this w that you see floating around will play a very minor role, but basically it's any observable variable that we can also use for prediction, okay? So it could be, for example, the lags of, of, the, of the y and so on. Okay, so it's a pretty standard uh, fa latent factor model for prediction. We have the matrix form here, which is gonna come up at some point in, in, in the slides, so it's here uh, later on in the slides. So this is the, the first equation in matrix form. This is the second equation in, in matrix form where basically we're gonna call upper bar notation is gonna be observations from one plus H to big T, okay? Lower bar is called the lag version of the matrix from one to T minus H, okay? So this is the matrix notation uh, of, the, uh, of, the, of the equations, okay? So let me just do a one minute review on PCA, okay? We're gonna have a PCA step in our procedure and PCA step will follow exactly the standard PCA. So imagine we don't have any observable values W, K hat is gonna be the number of estimated factors, okay? So how does PCA work? 
Well, you take X lower bar, okay? Those are observations from one to T minus H. And then you uh, do similar level composition and you take the eigenvectors and you call them uh, Z, 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 okay? Z, okay? And of course, the factors, the estimated factor just Z times the vector X lower bar, the matrix X lower bar, okay? Then what do you do? Then you estimate alpha, which is the loading of y onto the factors by doing a regression of y onto the recover factors, okay? And then, okay, so now importantly, then how you get the forecast? Well, basically the z tells you how to build the factors out of x. The alpha tells you how to predict the y given the, the factors. So to do your forecast for the y in t plus h, what do you do? You combine the alpha and the z and the last observation of xt. Okay, so x, x big T is the last observation you have. You use Z to transform into the factors and then use alpha to make the prediction. So um, this is similar, they're not exactly the same as uh, the, the algorithm that Stock and Watson uses to, to do PCA. The difference is they use the entire X in the, to do single variable decomposition. And so they directly obtain FT for prediction for the first step. If there are some cases in which it can produce ex, kind of extreme forecast. So we're gonna beat our SPCA based on the first Method. Okay, but they're very simple. Okay. Okay, so what do we know about PCA? We know that uh, from by 2003 that the latent factors can be identified up to some uh, invertible matrix H. That's a classic result. And we also know something has changed. No, in the microphone. All right. So we also know that the identification uh, result requires that all latent factors are strong. Okay, so now these, these are gonna be important, uh, important uh, equations here. So lambda i uh, are gonna be the eigenvalues and B prime, uh, beta prime beta, right? Beta is matrix of exposure. So what's gonna matter are the eigenvalues of this matrix uh, beta prime beta, okay? So basically we need these eigenvalues to grow as fast as N, faster than N, okay? For, uh, to, to be able to identify uh, the, um, the factors. And this is basically the case where the, so of course, for the K, for the first K again back. Okay. So this is, um, uh, this is standard result on, this, on, 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 on PCA. It requires strong factors. Strong factor is the case where these eigenvalues are growing uh, at this rate and or higher. Now, um, by the recent paper by, by NX, so this is the strong factor case. Okay. Then there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a recent paper by, by NX. Well, what they do is they show, well, actually you need a weaker condition because there's a, an extra T here, okay? So the order needs to be N over T for these eigenvalues. So now this, what they show is that you still get consistent recovery of the factors. They, you know, the, the convergence is at a lower rate in this case, but you still get consistent, uh, consistent recovery, okay? Now, what we are gonna study is the case where these conditions fail, even the second condition fails. So we're gonna look at a, at a weaker set in which this, um, this condition n over t times lamb, the, the eigenvalues uh, are uh, not going to zero, okay? And so if, if that happens for even one of the k eigenvalues or corresponding to the factors, then you're not gonna be able to recover uh, to recover the, the factors, okay? So then PCA fails. So the idea here is again, if you, if you think what's, what's on the numerator and the denominator, right? Sorry, it's here. Uh, you have, you know, T is in the denominator. So as long as you have, you know, T is kind of large enough, keeping N and the, and the, and the eigenvalues fixed, then you're gonna recover the factors. But as we're taking the limit of T and N going to infinity and you keep adding predictors N grows, what this is saying is that if the information that we have, the exposures that we have from the predictors don't grow fast enough as you keep adding predictors, then at some point PCA will fail. Okay, so the idea is, if you keep up the prediction that uh, are basically contain more noise than signal, right? Then you're gonna hurt your estimation because you're making it harder and harder and harder for PCA to distinguish the noise from the signal. Okay, so that's the idea. So noise actively hurts you. And the entire point of our supervised PCA approach is precisely to remove the noise, uh, to, to, to remove these predictors that are noise. Okay. So let me show you how these equations look like in the one factor case, which is gonna be very simple to analyze. So it's a simplified case here. There's no W, so there's no kind of observable uh, predictors, observable uh, additional variables. And in fact, there's no F, uh, there's no Z either. So there's no kind of forecast error at all. If you know the factors, you know the, you know the Y. 
So here we're going to have uh, the idiosyncratic error matrix U is just a normal value of epsilon times a matrix A. And that condition, the eigenvalues we talked about before, for the one factor case actually boils down to this equation, which contains precisely the same information. Okay, so basically we're going to look at this. We're going to say, well, is there enough information in the betas compared to the n's that I have? Does this converge to zero or it converges to a constant delta? If it converges to some positive constant delta, then the, the factors that you recover f, they're going to satisfy, they're going to converge, they're going to converge in probability to do this, uh, to this p uh, eta, which is the projection on, on the, on the et etas, on this eigen is projection the eigen matrix for the eigenvectors eta. And the etas themselves are the eigenvectors of this matrix over here. And you can see there's this kind of the, this delta extra term. There's delta a, a prime. And that means that basically you're going to recover something which is not the true, the true factor, but it's distorted by idiosyncratic error. Okay. By how much? By this amount delta. So the farther you are from zero, the weaker is the factor, the more you are, uh, the more your, your recovery of the factors will be distorted. Okay. Now there is a special case in which A, A prime is actually the entity matrix. In that case, what's going to happen, you still recover the factors, uh, the factor space, but you still get biased estimate. In fact, you get basically an attenuation bias. Okay. Which should not be surprising because this is a question of noise in the predictors. And so noise kind of re reflected in this case as an attenuation bias. Now, as I was speaking about, uh, about this procedure, you probably have, uh, have connected this uh, to, uh, to another procedure which also uses information from the target, which is partial least squares, right? It seems pretty related to partial least squares, which is also kind of using information in the univariate correlations, but is not discarding uh, any, any predictors. So it turns out that the, the PLS actually is also biased. And in fact, it's biased in the exact same way as PCA. So asymptotically, PCA and PLS behave in the exact same way. They show the exact same biases. So what this tells you is that it's not just about using information from the predictors. It's what allows to kind of make progress on the weak factor case is to actually uh, screen out, remove the predictors that are not. Now, this comes at the cost, and the cost I will tell you later what it is. We need one assumption that allows to to, you know, to still make inference and still get a recover factors even after I discard predictors. But to the extent that you think you can do it, then it's better to discard the noisy predictors than to just, uh, than it is to, to, to just kind of reweight. Okay. So um, when you're in the multivariate, multidimensional model, as I said before, really it's really the minimum eigenvalues is the one, the, the key uh, summary statistic for this. Okay. So that's what we mean by weak factors. Okay, so all of our uh, uh, all of our um, asymptotes will be done in this limit, where this uh, object here does not converge to zero. Okay, so now let me show you SPCA, so supervised PCA in the one factor example. Okay, so how does it work? Again, this is just a little bit more formal than what I said before. You take all the predictors, you take your target, you compute univariate correlation, and then you only select those that have sufficiently high correlation. Okay, so I hat is the set of, uh, of predictors that we keep. These are the correlation between X and the target. And we're gonna only keep those that have sufficiently high correlation. So we can say Q is a tuning parameter. And uh, we can say, well, uh, you know, maybe we wanna keep the top 5% by absolute value of the correlation. Okay. And then what do we do? We implement PCA in this subset. So you can see it's actually pretty simple. Rather than taking PCA on the entire set, on the entire universe, I, I do PCA only on those predictors that are correlated with the target. Okay, so now under what, remember we're in a one factor case, okay? So the, the procedure stops here. There's no, not, no other steps, okay? This is kind of the Baron to shirani case, okay? So what's the key assumption here? Under which condition we can do it? It's actually here. The condition is that in the universe of predictors, there exists a subset I0, okay? That satisfies two problems. First, that the factor is strong in, the factor is strong in the subset, okay? Otherwise, you know, we, again, PCA would fail again, right? So we are gonna take PCA within the subset, we need this factor to be strong in this subset. And second, which is also important, that this, that this uh, subset is large enough. Now, why do we need to be large enough? Because we're effectively within, after we cut out all these, the other predictors, 
we're going to basically still exploit the binary result that tells us that we should recover the factors from PCA in this subset. So we still need uh, the, the set of predictors to be, uh, to be large, OK? So that's where, you know, here I think is a good place to think about, you know, whether our procedure will work or not. If I have a thousand predictors and maybe I have to only, let's say, 100 or 200 of them that are exposed to a factor, then if I can identify those 200, then I can have some hope that, you know, I, PCA will still work uh, to extract the factor from the subs. Now, if I have a thousand, uh, assets, a, a thousand predictors and I have one predictor that is actually exposed to that factor, well, there's no hope that, that, you know, once I cut down all the other 999, that we'll be able from one predictor to extract a signal from noise. So in a sense, the, this is what I, I was calling basically extremely weak from before. It, 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 there, is, there are cases where factors are so incredibly weak that there are all, so few assets that are exposed to them that there's just no way to recover them. Our procedure will not work in that case. Our procedure will work as long as a substantial number of predictors Will, uh, are exposed to the factors. And that's the second condition you see over here. Okay. So then what, under this one condition, basically that there exists a subset, then what we can show is that indeed, as long as, so what do we need? We need log N over, uh, over T going, uh, going to zero. So, you know, it's actually a pretty weak condition on the, on the growth rates. We, uh, we get consistent forecasts. We get consistent forecasts of the predictor or the target, okay? Now there's one more thing which you can see in here, which is we actually don't exactly even need to find the entire I zero. Okay, so you know may, maybe there are three to hundred predictors that are related to the target. Sorry, they're related to the, to the weak factor. We don't need to recover all two hundred of them. It's enough that we have a big enough subset of the I zero that in which the factor is strong. May we only find thirty of them because our 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 our, uh, our selection procedure is imperfect. We just need to find a subset of the subset in which the factors are strong for this to work, okay? Uh, now, there's another paper which is also kind of intuitively related to this, which is the scale PCA by Huang and Al. And it also uses univariate regression to rescale the, 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 the predictors and also you implement PCA. This, again, is, um, this will work under weaker conditions than, than by and, um, and, and, and N, but we still fail in the case of weak, uh, of weak factors that we consider. Why? Because again, there are some very noisy predictors that we're just much better off throwing away than keeping and contaminating the estimation. Okay, so now let's go to the core theoretical results of the paper, which is really the case of the multivariate factor. So this is really where the theoretical contribution of the paper is. Okay, so what do we want for economic applications? I think that we want to consider multiple factors of potentially different strengths that are identified by potentially different subset of the predictors. Okay, so this is a, is a tricky problem in the sense that if you just do the one-step procedure that I talked about now, you will in general fail to recover all the correct factors. You can even think, well, I may I can do selection once and then PCA several times, and that will also fail to recover all the factors. Okay, so it's the, this, this iteration that we, and the projection step that we add to this procedure will be very important to be able to recover all the factors. So let me show you this with a couple of examples. Okay, so there, these are, there, there's, there are two examples of a two-factor world where if we basically do the selection only once, we're going to fail to recover the factors. The first example is going to be a case where, as you will see, we're going to discard too few predictors. Okay, so here's the example. So at the top, so this is the, the matrix of the betas. These are different sets of predictors, and these are the two factors. Okay, so here what you see, you see that there is a, the, you see graphically at least, there's a small number of predictors that are exposed to the two factors, and there's a large number of predictors that are only exposed to the first factor, okay? Now, both factors, alpha is one, one, so both factors matter for prediction of one. So we really need to recover both of them, okay? So remember that this, the, the selection step looks at univariate correlations. So I'm gonna go to the data and ask, well, which of the predictors relate to one? Well, all these predictors, all of them, they load on F1, and F1 is useful for predicting Y, so they will all be selected. Okay, we, we, the first selection step is, is useless. You cannot discriminate anything because effectively the first factor is strong. Okay, so all the, select, all the assets will be selected, so the first factor will be recovered correctly via PCA, but when I go to the second factor, 
right? If I take another, another uh, I extract the second factor from PCA, well, I will be again in the case where now most of the assets have zero exposure and PCA will fail to extract the second factor. But the second factor was useful for prediction. So I'm gonna, I'm, my, my PCA will fail, okay? So this is a simple example where basically the weak factor is the second one. When I do selection, it's gonna be dominated by the first factor. And so I will basically do no selection, okay? The second case will be, again, in which now, PC, now this one step selection will fail because now we're gonna, sell, we're gonna discard too many predictors. So here's a bit of, here's the example. Now we have half of the assets in the top and half, so, so half of the predictors in the top and half of the predictors in the bottom. And what do we have here is that it's only the first factor that is useful for prediction. So when I do my selection and I ask which of the predictors actually relate to, to, to the target, well, it's gonna be only the first half. So my selection only keeps the first half. But notice that this first half of us is equally exposed to both factors. So when I go and do PCA, I will not recover F1. I'll recover F1 plus F2, assuming the two factors are the same values, okay? So this is a case where basically the selection keys all these us, all these predictors. And I'm left with predictors in which F1 and F2 are not distinguishable from each other. So again, you know, there's just no way in this context, once I've removed the second set of us or predictors, I have no way they can recover the second factor. Okay, so uh, so again, the, in this multi-factor uh, case, the uh, standard, uh, the, the one-step selection will not work. Okay, so this is our formally our supervised uh, PCA procedure. So first of all, we're going to remove the influence of W. W are these observable predictors, uh, the, the 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 help predict Y beyond F. These you know we're just basically residualize the Y's from the W and the X's from W. So W is thrown away, okay, forget about that. So we have this Y1, X1, which are the, these residual of this, of this projection on W, is the starting point, okay? We do a supervised selection that we, I, I, I told you before, and we extract the first factor from the subset, okay? That's gonna be F1, okay? Then I'm gonna project Y on F1 and get the corresponding piece of the alpha, okay? The loading of Y on the first factor. Now, what's new here is that we're gonna have a projection step. What we're gonna do is we're gonna project the entire, so the target onto the factor and all the X's onto the factor and we're gonna take residuals of both. And now we're gonna go back to the beginning. We're gonna compute the univariate correlation or what we're gonna call Y2 and X2. And again, we're gonna select the, the, the predictors whose residuals are most correlated with the residual Y2 and so on. And we're gonna keep doing this every time, uh, going back to the entire universe of predictors and selecting a subset. And we're gonna stop when we are gonna, you know, when you find that basically the things are not very much correlated anymore. Okay, so there's gonna be a second tuning parameter, which basically tells you the stopping point, which is, you know, if the correlation drops below, let's say 0.1, you stop. Okay, so effectively, I talked about two tuning parameters. Think of it in following. One of them, which is the Q before, tells me how many uh, predictors I, I, I choose, I select. And the second one will tell me uh, basically how many factors I extract, okay? Which is equivalent to saying uh, what is the threshold of the correlation, okay? And then I put everything back together, okay? Back with the W as well, and I make my prediction. Okay, so let me go back to the two examples and, and tell you why uh, supervised PCA with this iteration can actually solve the two issues, the, the two kind of examples we, we talked about before. So remember, this was the case where the first stage, there was nothing thrown out. So we're basically taking a random subset of the, uh, of the, of the, of the predictors. We extract the first factor, which is strong. Now we're gonna residualize with respect to this first factor. So all this part is gonna go away. And now we're gonna do the selection again and the new selection we in fact figure out that the only thing remaining that correlates with Y is the second base, is the first small set of predictors, okay? So the idea is with that we've extracted first, st strong factor first, we throw it away from everywhere, and then we, in the second stage, this is gonna go to zero, this is gonna go, you know, the only thing that helps with the prediction of Y is gonna be this first set of predictors, so our selection will zoom in onto this set, okay? So this is an easy case. The other case is also interesting 
uh, because remember what happens is in this case, the first selection only keeps the first half of the assets of the predictor repository. I have another paper on asset pricing. They, they use a similar approach. So I use assets and predictors kind of interchangeably. They are predictors, okay? <laughs> I will talk about that at the end if I have time. So the first set of predictors is this top half here. So remember that from the set of predictors, I can only extract F1 plus F2, okay? Um, so the first, the first factor of recovery is not F1, it's F1 plus F2. Then I, I project both my Y and my, and my predictors all on F1 plus F2. And so what's gonna happen is that the second set, now the first set of predictors is gonna have zero exposures, and the, the residuals, right? And the second set of predictors will be in fact exposure to what? To F1 minus F2. So my, in my second selection, I will focus on, this, on the second half. And what I will extract from the second PCA will be F1 minus F2, okay? So what this shows is that in the case where there's these correlate exposures, you might not recover F1 and F2 in this order. You might recover some rotation of that. First F1 plus F2 and F1 minus F2. That's totally fine, right? As long as by the end of it, I recover the entire factor space. Okay. So the conditions for which we get consistency is effectively the same as before. We basically need that every one of the factors is, is strong in some subset. Some of them might be strong in a big subset. Some of them might be strong in a small subset. As long as each of them is recoverable, then we will get consistency of the forecast. Okay, so now there's one more theoretical result, and then I'm gonna show you some simulation and some empirical results. So um, um, the, there is this one additional condition that you can see here. There is, I'm gonna discuss in one second, but it's a condition based that says that the factors are sufficiently useful for prediction. Okay, so the alpha, alpha is, a, remember, it's the loading of Y onto the factor. Okay, so alpha needs to be you know, sufficiently large. You cannot have alphas that are very close to zero. So factors, they're basically useless for prediction, not very useful for prediction. As long as all the latent factors are sufficiently useful for prediction, then you get this additional result. You get the, you know, the, this number of factors estimated by basically the stopping rule uh, is a consistent estimator of the true number of factors. We recover the entire factor space and we get the CLP, okay? Now, it might be, it's useful to spend one minute thinking about why do we need the additional assumption? So let's think what happens if alpha, one of the pieces of alpha is equal to zero. So there is a factor that is just not very useful for Y. Then why do we care about this factor? If it's not useful for prediction, they will not recover, but we don't miss much. And that's why we don't need this assumption for consistency. However, you know, omitting this factor will have higher order effects. It turns out they affect the forecast variance, for example. That's why to obtain a CLT, we do need this additional assumption, uh, but for the consistency result, we do not. Okay, so that's it. Okay, so that's a procedure. That's some example on when, why it works. Now, let me show you a couple of simulations and then empirical results. So the simulation is very simple. It's a three-factor model where the first two factors are strong. Okay, so their, their, their loadings to these factors are drawn from a normal zero one. And there's a third factor is weak, and this factor, basically the, 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 uh, the, the loadings of the predictors on this factor are drawn as follows. For a fraction A of them, okay, say 5% of them are drawn from this also big, you know, normal zero one. But from, for the remaining ones, one minus A, they're drawn from is normal 0 0.001. Okay, so basically the, the loadings are small. So think of the case, the simulation, a case where we have A of the assets are exposed to the factor and the remaining are basically not exposed to the factor. And in our simulation, we're gonna have that the third factor is indeed the one that matters for prediction. So we really wanna recover that. I'm gonna show you results on, on two sets of results. One of the mean square error, the auto sample mean square error prediction, and the other will be uh, the recovery of these alpha loadings, okay? So if you don't recover alpha, which is how the Y depends on the factor, we're not gonna do recovery. Uh, we're not gonna do forecast properly. So I'm gonna show you basically the, 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 the alpha that we estimate how it relates to the true alpha. Okay, so, and I'm comparing here uh, supervised PCA, PCA, and PLS, okay? And I'm gonna show you what happens with a different number of factors. So three is the right number of factors. So hopefully we can recover that consistently, but let's see what happens also when we get this, uh, the wrong number of factors. These are the mean score errors of the prediction, and these are the recovery of the, of the alpha. So we would like to see basically both of these equal to zero. Uh, well, as low as possible, let's say. So, this is the first simulation has 200 
predictors, uh, 200 times the, the, the length of the time series is 200, and then half of the assets are strong. So, the, so half of the assets are exposed to the, to the third factor, which as you will see, is basically already a strong factor. Okay, so if, if in, in, in simulations at least, if, I, if about half of the assets are, ex are exposed, you, you, you get strong, the factor is strong. So you can see that basically the mean square error that is achieved by these three procedures is basically the same. Okay, so with, uh, with SPCA, with PCR, and with PLS, you get very similar uh, mean square error because basically it's, it's a standard case where everything here is working well, you know, as in thought. And similar, you get very similar recovery of the alpha vector. Okay, so that's, that's the standard result. Now things get more interesting where things where the factors are weak. When the factors are weak, now there's only five percent. Sorry, let me say something. So half of the of the uh, of the predictors are exposed to the to the third factor. So there's one hundred of them. Okay. Uh, here there's still a hundred predictors that are, that are exposed to the factor, but now we have two thousand predictors. So the A is is, is low. So now only five percent of the predictors are exposed to to the factor. And what do you see here? You see uh, that indeed uh, SPCA basically again achieved recovery of the alpha well and achieves a pretty low mean square error compared to the other procedures. They do not achieve similar mean square error and do not achieve a, a similar recovery of alpha. Okay, so this is really mirroring the, uh, the theory that we, that we develop. Uh, it just shows it basically in the simulation. Now, there was one thing that comes out of the simulation that is interesting that we have not analyzed theoretically. Which is that if you look at the mean square error of SPCA, it kind of improves up to the right number of factors and it kind of degrades pretty quickly as you have used too many factors. Okay, so that's something interesting that you will see. Uh, it's, it's also going to come up in the empirical results. The empirical results are going to have basically out the, you know, the auto sample R square will improve up to a certain point and then decrease pretty quick. Okay, so that's, that's um, that you'll see the same signature of this, of this SPCA in the empirical results. Okay. Let me skip this and go to the empirical evidence. So we do two exercises here uh, that you, you know, it's using data that you know all very well, you're using your own work. Uh, one is gonna use uh, the FRED data, the FRED MD data with monthly data since 1960. The second is using the FRED data plus individual blue chip forecasts starting 93. These are forecasts, so we're not gonna use just the consensus, we're gonna use uh, forecasts of, um, uh, of the individual forecasters as well, like some of the uh, previous work has done. And we're gonna use uh, monthly data. So let me, let me start with the FRED, uh, the FRED data, which is nice because it's a longer time series with no gaps, which is a big problem for uh, individual forecasters. We're gonna try to predict uh, three targets, inflation, industrial production growth, and employment growth. And we're gonna use monthly data since 1960. And I'm gonna use a baseline uh, prediction horizon in three months and show you the results for different prediction horizons. Now, remember we have two tuning parameters here, right? One is how many predictors we select, and the second is how many factors do we, do we use. Now, rather than tuning these and show you just one result, we just plot you all the combinations, okay? So you can get a sense of how the, the procedure is working. So SPCA, I will consider for this exercise 30 predictors, 50 predictors, and 100 predictors. Now, you might imagine that as we get closer to, uh, you know, to 127, the, the results of SPCA will converge to those for PCA. That would be the case. And this other extreme would be the case where we do the kind of maximum selection. We cannot go too low because we need that subset that we choose to be large. And, uh, you know, we're going to use the, uh, we're going to control for lags of the target and that our benchmark is all going to be relative to what you achieve with just the autoregressive uh, model of, for the target with the BSC selected number of lags. Okay. Just a little picture of the data. These are the eigenvalues. Okay, one to 10, there's a typo there. Uh, so you can see that there are kind of pretty clearly three strong factors and perhaps a few more weaker factors. It's always kind of really hard to pick from this graph the number of factors. So again, I will show you the results for with up to five eigenvalues. Okay. And <clears throat> these uh, are, uh, this is again in the full sample, this is before I go to the out sample prediction, just to give you a sense of what SPCA is doing. In the in sample, using a full sample, what are the variables that are predicted by supervised PCA? Okay, so remember that thread is basically grouping the variables in groups. Okay, so there's output, labor, housing, consumption, money, rates, prices, and stock market. And basically, these are the 
30 fact so it is the case for 30 where we select 30 predictors for each of the five factors you can see in dark the 30 that are uh, selected the, the by by spca okay so i alternated red and blue so there's no near me in red and blue they're just the group of red there's a group of blue so you can distinguish the groups that was the best i could come up with uh okay so basically you what well, let me just guide you through one let's look at the first extraction the first factor what is it selecting from which to extract the first factor nothing from output almost nothing from labor except these last variables nothing from housing only one variable from consumption a few from money a lot from rates uh, a lot from prices and nothing for the stock market okay so it's really you can see it's not kind of spreading them around in this case this is for predicting inflation spca says look the variables that most correlate with, with with predicting inflation in a univariate way are the ones you see in the darker color now you can see that as you look at the different factors now we're authorized with first one sometimes you keep choosing the same variables because the same variables may be still useful for for, for uh, extracting many factors uh for example you know the prices you might not be surprised by this but the prices variable are in fact very useful and the rates variables are also very useful but also some changes for example in the second factors housing appears which you know and then it kind of stays there uh, and there's one variable from output that, that appears at the very end you know the stock market appears but only after factor three so i think there's something interesting we can see about what are the variables and how exactly uh, spca is choosing uh for ip growth you get different selections for example remember the housing didn't play a very important role for inflation but it does play a very important role for industrial production growth and prices don't play a very important role okay so it, it basically is it, it, a way to kind of check that it's behaving the way that we think it should behave it's pretty it's picking variables that are used okay and then we can compare the factors from pca with the factor from spca uh so just to give you an example you know to the, this again we're selecting only 30 predictors okay so you you know if you pre, if spca and pca will give you similar results you should observe obviously very high correlation of the factors or spca was just basically selecting a random subset, subset but it's not and you can see that for example the first factor from pca doesn't actually correlate that much with any of the factors from spca there's maybe a little bit correlation with the third similarly the, the first factor of spca is actually mostly correlating with the third and fourth factor of pca the very first factors they actually very have very low correlation okay that's for inflation you have more correlation for industrial production growth you can see here the strong negative correlations in the diagonal and again very low correlation uh, between the first factors factor and factor for uh, for unemployment okay now finally let me get to the predictive r square we do basically pretty standard expanding window uh, estimation starting from 240 months so we have 20 years to train the model and then we we uh, we we look at the auto sample r square again this is the benchmark here the, of the r square is marginal to the uh, AR process, okay? So these are the, the one, the, I, I don't have a lot of time left, so I've got to show just a few results. So this is the number of factors, this is for inflation on the left. These are the number of factors, okay? And the dash, these are R squares compared to the AR model. These uh, dash red lines are the PCA, and then the dark, uh, the, the gray lines are the SPCA with a different number of predictors. So the darker the line, the closer you are to PCA. Okay, so you can see that the dark black line is very close to what you get for PCA, and then the others get farther away. You can see that the improvement, as you keep selecting fewer and fewer predictions, there's a pretty significant improvement uh, in R square, out of sample R square compared to, to PCA. You see the same when you look at uh, unemployment, and when you, sorry, when you look at IP growth and when you look at unemployment. Okay, so do you see this kind of gives you a sense of the entire range of results for all the two tuning parameters, one of them being the number of factors one of them being the number of, of predictors selected you also see a hint here that of this uh, this thing i told you that at some point you see that the performance going bad uh, if you have too many factors for spca this is for one month prediction where things look a little worse okay it does very well for inflation not so well for the other two and then but and again you see this kind of you know deep, your bad performance if you use too many factors and again, uh, and this is for six months. Uh, uh, with, uh, you know, where again, you see it does better PCA, significantly better PCA. And at some point, when you use too many factors, the performance decreases. 
Okay. Why? Because you're basically you're adding estimation uh, error, adding useless factors, and that's really detrimental. Okay. So now let me just show you one result with the blue chip forecast. The blue chip forecast, in a sense, is a harder exercise because we have only data from 93, but also because we don't want to just, yes, no, no, I'm, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Uh, we don't just try to beat the AR for model. We're actually going to try to beat the, the consensus as well. So among our predictors for the benchmark, we use the AR lags, the lags of the target and the, and the consensus forecast. Uh, and here, uh, you also see that, you know, that the SPCA does better than, than PCA, but and then if you have too many factors, the performance deteriorates, okay? So it, it, what this is saying is that it's really important when we're working on doing the tuning uh, of, of the, of, you know, you doing the cross-validation and so on, but basically it's important to pick the tuning parameter to make sure you don't go beyond the threshold, the true number of factors, because then the performance deteriorates, which is something that's also so in simulations, as I showed you before. Okay, I'm done. So what we do in this work is we propose supervised PCA in the prediction context, uh, basically to deal with weak factors useful uh, for forecasting. And it, we think that this, the idea of using supervision for selection, it's something that in this paper we show it's useful for forecasting. I, I, I had three more slides that we not go talk about, which are about applying similar ideas to the problem weak factors in asset pricing, where you can screen out the test assets in that case that are not useful for extracting the factors is the same idea, okay? Um, but here, these papers are prediction, and we think that the, the beauty of that is of the iterated procedure is that it really allows us to deal with many factors of potential different strengths uh, and that are uh, identified by different subsets. And I'm going to close here. Thank you very much again for the invitation. Thank you. you can speak up and I can repeat your question. So I, I wanted to learn better the difference between the procedure and uh, partial risk spread. So that's like a, a big yeah. That. And I understand it must be like when you eliminate some of the. Okay. Yeah. So 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 the, here's the idea. The idea is that ultimately, if you think about the way that that the PLS is is do, constructing the factors, right? It's it's basically reweighting re the various predictions yeah. by putting more weights on those that have high correlation and putting less weight on those that have low correlation. But you're still putting weight on those predictors that have low correlation. Those are basically what I'm going to call the noisy predictors. Now, it's not a big deal if you have, you know, out of 1,000 assets, 500 have, are, have high correlation, have, have low correlation. But if you have 950, which have low correlation, are basically noise, you still end up in all putting a lot of weight on those. And so the reweight, in a sense, is not enough. So that's, that's really, it turns out to be an important distinction. Uh, it's the intuition is similar, but it turns out that entirely removing the predictors really solves the, the noise issue in a much better way. Sorry? Yeah, so Q is very important. So let me that I can show you very better if I go back to the to the equation. In the it's even clearer in a one factor case. So Q needs to satisfy some properties. Okay, one second. It's here, okay? So Q needs to satisfy some properties, okay? So what do you need? You need basically this assumption. You need that uh, the, remember that I zero is the subset of the asset that truly are informative. And then QN is the ones you pick out of those, okay? So basically you need to, to you know, the, the number of total assets, which is Q times N needs to go to infinity. So the, the properties of Q, Q can change over time, like with N, but it needs to change in a way that preserves this property. Okay, so I, I do think that it, uh, so I think that the general idea of using the supervision, the supervised procedure to select, uh, to select the, um, to select the predictors is certainly extendable to other ways to select things. Okay, so, you know, we're using univariate correlation because it's, e it's a very easy way that still gives you consistency. Is at this step you want to introduce some linearities or it's at the, in a later step, at this step? I think it can be done. Yeah, I mean, the question is, you know, the question is what's the game? 
Okay, the, there might be situations where you get a gain in efficiency, for example, compared to this position. Absolutely. It's possible. I mean, you can also, it's so yes. Here, the nonlinearity, if you want, is really the fact that you can choose any predictors you want. You can make, you can introduce the nonlinearities by making your predictors nonlinear and then use this linear screening. There are, I'm, sh I'm sure you can try to extend it to a more nonlinear selection in itself. Yes. There's right. one question down there. You mean the threshold Q? You sorry, I, I could just repeat the question. So do I need okay? You mean the threshold Q or the, the threshold of correlations? Yeah, so I, yeah, so then might actually be the reason why uh, we get this, this, deep, this decrease of performance once we introduce too many factors. That could be the reason. So we, we've been thinking about that actually, whether you, we should, for now we'll be using the same trash, okay? Uh, but, uh, but maybe, maybe and, you know, again, it's a matter of, of efficiency. Consistency is guaranteed under these conditions. Maybe we can do better. Maybe we can avoid this kind of re reduction in performance uh, as you have too many factors by maybe changing the threshold as you, that, that's totally plausible. Because at some point the correlation start getting very small, right? So yes, that, that's, we are thinking about that. Thank you. Yeah. It's quite interesting to see the correlation between the IT growth and housing price in your uh, Yeah. Are there any you know, intuitions for that or not? That's a good question, you know. <laughs> uh, house prices matter for the economy, you know? There are wealth effects. There are, uh, I don't know, I, I, I have no idea. <laughs> but, but, you know, it, look, these are all important macro variables. And there's quite a big, bit of, uh, you know, housing matters for the economy, right? It's a big, big fraction of people's wealth. So the price is not that surprising. I mean, in general, let me also say, industrial production is actually pretty difficult to predict. It's not like, uh, so. <clears throat> I have one question. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you didn't mention much about uh, cost validation for the tuning parameters. And uh, I wonder if you, because I mean, like here it's based on the correlation. Now, I mean, like in a booms and recessions, I mean, like, you know, correlation change quite a lot. So, I mean, like, in a way, I mean, you have to do a, maybe a, a special thinking about yeah, yeah. applying this to. A, I completely agree. I mean, let's say, first of all, we have two different exercises for which we need to think probably differently because for the, the freight data goes back to the 60s, we're a lot more data mm -hmm. for the. <laughs> For the blue chip data, it's always a much shorter time series. So we have to be a little more careful. But yeah, I mean, then you, you add the fact that there are structural breaks, you know, from the 60s to today, there are certain structural breaks in inflation, right? And yeah. then, so we're, we're thinking about all that. That's why I didn't want to take a strong stand no, today. No, I just showed the results. Yeah. It, it will be an important. Uh, I completely agree. These are C, C, uh, C and Q with two tuning parameters. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Yeah, you're, you're right. 